Well, good morning, folks. Lovely to see you all this morning. Bid you all a warm welcome. Uh, just draw your attention to one or two of the notices. You can probably work out by the smell. There's a church lunch uh, today. Hope you can stay uh, for that. It's plenty for everyone. Uh, God willing, this evening, uh, Ozzy will be taking our evening service for him. I am sorry I have to be away again this evening. I don't like being away two weeks in a row, but I'm away this evening in Newton Arts. And uh, uh, there's an ordination of elders there. and. I haven't been into a moderator, they asked me if I come and preach for them tonight, so I'm preaching at their ordination installation and service uh, this evening, and obviously it's uh, willing to take on their responsibilities tonight. Our prayer time then, after the evening service, and then our midweek meeting this week, it's a Bible study, and it's a in-person Bible study, again, this coming Tuesday evening, 8 o'clock, I will put up the questions later on uh, this evening. Then also, it's the February's the month that the elders and ministers of our presbytery meet in one of their regular meetings. That's this Tuesday evening, 7.30 in North Bracken. Then on Wednesday evening, do continue to remember our English class outreach. And then on Friday, our warm space outreach. You have seen some of the information of that from the WhatsApp group as well. So do continue to pray for this. Uh, I remind you then of the different conferences that are planned. There's the Family Day Conference, the 11th of March, and then the RP Weekend Conference, uh, 17th the 19th of March, and then our dates that we plan to celebrate the, the Lord's Supper there, 26th of February, 21st of May, and 12th of November. Well, we gather to worship God this morning, and we commence our worship as we turn to the words of Psalm 93, <coughs> the air setting of this psalm. Psalm that reminds us of the God whom we worship this morning, the one who is robed with majesty, the one who is might and strength, the one who has made all that there is, the one who is from everlasting, the one who is enthroned eternally, the one who is mightier by far than the, than the mighty roars of the floods, the one who has spoken into this, this world in his word, and the one who has sent his son, Jesus Christ. We sing these five verses of Psalm 93a as we worship them together. opportunity to gather in the name of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and render our worship and adoration to you in his name. We acknowledge you, living God, as the only true God, the one in whom we live and move. You're the God who is governor of all things. You're the Lord who rules and reigns on high. 
you the Lord who is robed, as we've been seeing, in majesty most bright. You remember the scriptures of how the angels of heaven and Isaiah's vision cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We bless you that you're the God of great strength, that there is nothing that is beyond your power and ability in accordance with your righteousness. We bless you that all the plans that you have made for this world, you will be able to achieve and no one and nothing can stand in your way. We bless you, mighty God, that in your power you made this whole world, made it out of nothing in the space of six days and also very good. But we acknowledge, Lord, that this world is not as you made it, that sin has come in and brought, left its mark not only on us as human beings, but on all creation. And so we bless you for Jesus Christ, the one whom you sent, the saviour of sinners, the reverser of the curse that was brought by Adam, and the one who one day will usher in the new heavens and earth, where all will be very good and never spoilt again. Thank you for this Lord's Day to reset our lives according to all your plans and purposes and according to your word. We ask that you administer to us, Lord. We ask that the word that we read and the word that we sing and the word that is preached would come with the power and authority of heaven. We ask for eyes to see your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask for that eye of faith to understand more of him as he's revealed in his word. And we say with your servant of old, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. We ask, Lord, that we would be delivered from just the formality of gathering again, the regularity of that, and that you would meet with us. We thank you for the working of your spirit. We thank you that you sent him out, Father and Son. We thank you that he delights to shine the light on Jesus Christ. And we know that he does that. We'll be blessed. Pardon us our sins, Lord. We have not walked with you as we should have. Our words, O oh God, have not been kind and loving as they ought to have been. Our, our actions have uh, been against your law on so many occasions. We have left undone, too, the things that we should have seen to. Lord, forgive us. And we pray that as we see the glory of Christ, that we will love him more and hear our sin more and serve him more. Bless those who are gathered here. Thank you for each one. For those who aren't able to be here today, some, Lord, serve you in other places today. Some are unwell. And we ask that you would give them recovery and blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're continuing our, our reading in Matthew's Gospel this morning. We're going to read in Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to break into this uh, eighth chapter of Matthew at verse 23. And we're going to read on into chapter 9 and verse 8. Uh, just as you're looking that up, and speak to the, the boys and girls for the moment. I wonder if you've been out on a very stormy day. You've been out in the wind when it's blowing strong, yeah? Have you ever been out in the wind and it's been so strong that mummy or daddy has to hold on tightly to your hand because you would get blown over. Uh, I wonder if you've ever been down at the seaside on a really stormy day and the waves are coming, crashing in. I wonder if you ever tried talking to the wind or saying to the waves, stop splashing. Have you ever tried that? I don't think so. Because would it work? Would the waves stop splashing? Would the wind stop blowing if you just said stop? No, it wouldn't, because we're just ordinary human beings. But in our Bible reading today, we're going to be seeing the Lord Jesus. And he actually just told the wind, stop blowing. And he told the waves to calm down. And they did. Because he wasn't an ordinary person like us. He was God as well as man. And he came to rescue us from our sins. So we're going to be learning about him today. So let's read from Matthew chapter 8, from verse 23, on into chapter 9 and verse 8. And he, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. 
And behold, there arose a great storm in the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the, ma and the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled. And going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold... All the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Well, we turn to the words of Psalm 33, to sing praise to God just now. <coughs> We're seeing the opening six large verses of Psalm 33. <clears throat> We're reminded in this psalm that the Lord is the one who created the very sea. Verse 4 it says, The waters of the sea he brings together as a heap, and in the storehouses he lays up the mighty oceans deep. He created them, so it's no surprise that he is far over the waves, and the Lord walked upon this earth. <laughs> psalm 33, these six verses would sing to God's praise. Your righteous in the Lord
help you to have your Bible open or at least the order of service open where the words from the Bible are printed out for you. As we come to look at another part of Matthew's Gospel in our morning service, we are making our way bit by bit through uh, this wonderful Gospel according to Matthew. I've entitled this sermon on, on these uh, uh, words today, Awesome Authority, and we're looking at from chapter 8, verse 23 to chapter 9 and verse 8. That's the bit of the Bible that you should understand a little bit more about uh, before you leave today. You want to understand it in your heads. Uh, God hasn't just given us the Bible to feed our heads with it. He's given it to change our hearts and our lives by it as well. Well, imagine for a moment Cristiano Ronaldo came to church. I know some of, for some of you perhaps you wouldn't have the foggy notion who he, who he is. But... For those who do, uh, let's say he's wearing a disguise, a uh, moustache, long-haired wig, so we don't recognise who he is. And because we didn't recognise him, we might ask him all sorts of foolish questions. What do you work at? Do you come here often? Is there anything we can help you with? <clears throat> do you need some money to get you going a little bit? You see, if you don't know who someone is, then we very often don't relate to them properly. And that's exactly the same with the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone is trying to work out who this person is just in their own thinking and reasoning, they're not going to relate properly to Jesus. If someone is trying to piece together a picture about Jesus Christ from uh, all sorts of opinions of other people, they're not going to relate to him properly. But God in the, in the Bible has told us exactly who his son is so that you and I can relate to him as we should. Matthew's gospel has a particular point that it's making. It's making the point that Jesus is the long-promised Messiah. It was probably given in the initial setting to people from a Jewish background. And they needed to know that this, this uh, way that was before them of knowing God wasn't a new way. But was simply the, on, the outworking and the ongoing flow of the Old Testament. That's why we saw in the introduction to this book, in chapters 1 to 3, Matthew said that this Jesus is the Messiah. He's the descendant of David. You remember his family tree. And he's the one... Uh, who was uh, the prophet greater than Moses. We saw then in the first of the five big chunks of Matthew, remember Matthew is given it, but it would seem in five big chunks. We saw in the first big chunk, chapters four to seven, that Jesus Christ is the king who teaches like no one else. And for many months, we were encamped listening to him preach the Sermon on the Mount. A couple of weeks ago when we were in Matthew's Gospel, we began to look at the second chunk of Matthew. That's chapters 8 to 11. And we saw him there that he was the king mighty to save. In this second bit of Matthew, Matthew selects nine miracles. Uh, they're not how they were and how they happened in time. Uh, but he just picks them out, guided by the Spirit. Because they're, su they're supporting his argument that Jesus Christ is the God-given Messiah. They were his credentials. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. No one else could heal the leper. No one else could restore the centurion's son. No one else could restore Peter's mother-in-law. <clears throat> and so in the last uh, time when we looked at the opening 22 verses, we saw that Jesus is the Messiah because he is able to change the unchangeable. He came to reverse the curse. And now today, in three more miracles, we see not only his great power, but we see his awesome authority. So today you're going to see in the Bible, Jesus' awesome authority over nature. You'll see his awesome authority over supernatural powers. And you'll see his awesome authority over the greatest problem of humanity. Our sin. So, three big things here where we see Jesus' awesome authority. Let's look at them one by one. They're really startling scenes. Picture them in your mind if it helps you. 
So now you need to look at verses 23 to 27, where we're going to explore his authority over nature. Authority over nature. After the first three miracles, we saw the last time that there was always a response to what Jesus was doing. And by and large, the response of the people to the miracles of Jesus was at a very superficial level. They just wanted more miracles from this miracle worker. They, they didn't seem to think at all about the deeper things that he was saying. For example, when he healed a leper. That's leprosy, a great picture of sin in the Bible. They, they didn't seem to make the connections and they just came after him, most of them, do another trick, Jesus. Do another one of your, your great mighty acts. But the Lord Jesus, he wasn't interested in such a response. So we see that in verse 18, he moves on. We're told when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. You, you would think he would do the complete opposite. A great crowd, a great opportunity, but Jesus knew their hearts. They just wanted the miracles. And so they head across to the other side. The other side in verse 23 uh, so the other get into the boat, he says there, and his, his disciples followed him. And where he is going now is across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He got into a boat, and his disciples followed him. So he's not staying with the crowds. He's not staying with the people who just wanted another miracle. He's heading out across the sea. It's going to be a journey of about five or six miles across to the other side. Um, Matthew doesn't tell us in his account, but the other gospel writers told us, Mark tells us, that there was a whole flotilla of little ships, little boats, heading out across the Sea of Galilee in the evening. And Matthew tells us, as the other gospels tells us, that our Lord Jesus, he was asleep in the stern of the boat. He was utterly exhausted. Have you ever been exhausted? Ever had just your works just so demanding that you are just drained and uh, just collapse? Well, here's Jesus Christ who, who knows every experience of life for he was a real man, yet still God. Verse 24, you'll see that he was asleep and Matthew writes it that he was sound asleep, completely out of it. Well, it's a lovely little picture, isn't it? Here's Jesus Christ, the God-man, and he's going out across this sea. There's a great storm, but he's in complete peace and complete calm because he knows the plan of God and he knows the purposes of God, that he will die for sinners to transform the lives of many and one day to transform the whole world, the whole creation. What a contrast it was, his calm heart and the raging storm. Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. Uh, Matthew chooses a, a, a different word from the other gospel writers. Uh, the word that he uses for this storm here, we get our word seismology from it. Uh, uh, it's to do with earthquakes. This storm was so ferocious, it was as if the whole earth was shaking. It, it wasn't just a, a little bit of a swell that was on here. It was a ferocious, intense storm. Can you imagine it? The waves are crashing over this boat and the wind is blowing. And the boats that Jesus was in had others in it and the other little boats that were around about that Mark tells us were full of others, others too. Lots of different men out on the sea. And the men who were out in the sea weren't the sailors that you might see if you're out for a walk along the path on the lock shore out past Coutreau and they're getting into the nice little dinghies for an afternoon sailing on the lock. Uh, these were rough-handed fishermen who knew the Sea of Galilee like the proverbial back of their hands. And this storm is so ferocious that these hardened sailors go to the man who's asleep in the back of the boats, the carpenter of Nazareth, and they ask him to do something. 
Isn't that quite ironic? They come and they speak to the carpenter of Nazareth. And they demand, and they, or rather they, they said to him, Save us, Lord, verse 25. We are perishing. They were in utter panic about this storm. Well, maybe you're not in a physical storm this morning. Of course you're not. You're here in, a, in the calm. But maybe there's a different storm in your life. And it's just as if your whole life is shaking. Well, here's the one to go to. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you notice how tender he was with these men. They've cried out to him, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And we're told in verse 26, he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Don't imagine that to be a scolding tone. It was simply the gentle prodding of Jesus Christ stirring up their hearts to look ever more deeply to himself. Hard to be critical of them though, isn't it? Silly disciples, didn't they know that the Lord of all the earth was with them? And they're frightened? And they're forgetful? And yet, isn't that? Well, it's certainly me, perhaps it's you. But these men would never forget that night. We're told there at the end of verse 26. Then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea and there was calm. Can you imagine that? From these crashing waves, this howling gale, and it stops at an instant. And the sea is just like a piece of, piece of mirror, like a proverbial pond. Oh, the might and the power of Jesus Christ. He came to transform all that was broken by his awesome authority. And look at the response that people made. The men marvel, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds of the sea obey him? You see, they, they didn't have a category to put Jesus into. What sort of man is this? This is no ordinary man. They were right. It was the God-man, Jesus Christ. They were beginning to dawn that this is someone so exceptional. I wonder if that reality dawned for you yet. What sort of man is this? So Jesus, awesome authority. But then there's a second little picture that Matthew selects guided by the Spirit. And that's in verses 28 to 34. Now you need to look at those words. And we see here his authority over supernatural powers. You see, it's one thing for Jesus Christ to have authority over sickness as he did with the leper in chapter 8. And he is healed in an instant. It's one thing for Jesus Christ to have authority over creation. But there are other mighty and powerful things in this world besides illness and besides the natural elements. There are the powers of this dark world. There is a devil and there are his demons. Does Jesus Christ's authority extend over that or is it the case with Jesus just like in Star Wars or whatever that you've got these two equal powers, the, the dark power and against what's light and good? Is that just how it is with Jesus and this world? Is these, are these just two equal, powerful, authoritative uh, uh, beings? Well, not according to, to the scripture. Because here we see his authority over the supernatural powers. The Apostle John uh, writes in his first epistle in chapter uh, 3 and verse 8 that Jesus Christ came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. And here in this little incident, Matthew's giving a little picture of Jesus Christ 
doing just that. That all that he would accomplish fully and finally through the cross. Now this next miracle you'll see in verse 28. He came to the other side, that's of Galilee, to the country of the Gadarenes. Now just in case you've been reading your Bible this morning, well, I hope you have, but just in case you were reading Mark this morning in your quiet time, you'll be thinking, oh, did it not Mark not say, did Luke not say that it was the country of the Gerasenes? Is this just one of these, another one of these so-called mistakes of the Bible? Is it the country of the Gadarenes or is it the country of the Gerasenes? Well, actually, it's both. It's just like saying, Woodstock RP Church in Belfast, bigger picture, or Woodstock RP Church in the Woodstock Road in East Belfastish. So it's not a contradiction. Just Matthew hones in the the coordinates in a different way. <clears throat> and just in case you've been reading this morning this account in the other Gospels and Mark and Luke mention that there was just one man and Matthew says that there were two. In case someone says to you, there you go, there's another one of those contradictions in the Bible. No, it's not. Uh, the other Gospel writers uh, they weren't contradicting when they mentioned just one man there. Well, there was just one man. And there was another one man with that one man. They were just simply recording the same details of the same situation from a different perspective. And they're a rather scary pair, aren't they? Two demon-possessed men met him coming up out of the tombs. That's a bit spooky for a start, isn't it? So fierce that no one could pass that way. They're a frightening lot. And they're frightening because they are possessed of the devil. His demons have taken control of these poor men's lives. You know that in the Bible, it seems to tell us that when Jesus Christ was on earth, that all the powers of darkness were particularly busy that's why you've got many situations in the, in the New Testament speaking about uh, people being demon-possessed uh, because the devil was doing his utmost to, to stop Jesus Christ from doing his great work on the cross. And he was particularly busy. He's still busy, of course. Still busy in demon possession. In some parts of the world you go to today, it would be quite prolific. And perhaps it's more prolific here than we would realize too at times. But in Bible times it would seem that the devil was particularly busy. And look what they said. Isn't it very interesting? And behold, verse 29, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Now we should just go, wow. Nobody else has recognized this. The crowds are just coming and saying, do you know one of those tricks, Jesus? But these two demon-possessed men, the powers of darkness at work within them, they recognize in an instant who is before them. It is the Son of God. James will write in James chapter 2 and verse 19 later in the New Testament. Even the demons of the devil believes in God. And these two men possessed of the devil, they believed who it was who was before them. Not in a saving way, of course, they, but they knew it was. Well, of course they knew. Of course they knew. The, the, the demons who had possessed these men were fallen angels, according to the message of the Bible. And there had been a time in eternity that these fallen angels had not been fallen angels and had worshipped in all eternity the triune God. And though they have now fallen and are unredeemable, they still knew who, who was before them. What an ironic thing. They, the people don't quite get it, but these men, their demons got it. And they knew something else. Did you get it? In verse 29. 
What have you to do with us, O Son of God? And here it comes. Have you come here to torment us before the time? So they knew not only who it was who was before them, they knew exactly what he was here in this world to do. They knew that their destiny, because of what he had come to do, was their unending torment forever in the pit of hell from when, whence they would never come forth again. They knew that they were doomed, as it were, that their, their days were limited. They knew that the time had been set, that when because of the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ, all trace of evil would be wiped from this earth. So they know who he is and they knew what he was about. And they had a request. Verse 30, now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. Well, we're not told why they made that request, and we're not told why Jesus agreed to their request, and we'll not try and speculate as many, I think, foolishly do. But the power and authority of Jesus Christ that was all that was needed to release these two men from the devil's clutches. The demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away. And he said to them, Go. So they came out, went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Well, of course, the animal rights folk would have a headache with this and they would miss the whole point of it. Why did Jesus permit this? Why was his authority over this? Why did he grant them permission? Well, he was showing that he had authority over everything. And it's, what, it's in what happens to these pigs that in his kindness, he allows their destruction. Wasn't it 2,000 pigs, the other gospel writers say? And he was wanting the people to see this is what the devil has in store for men and women. Destruction. And he gives us, he allows this grand spectacle of 2,000 pigs going over the edge to destruction. And the Lord Jesus in his kindness was saying to all who would hear this, Oh wow, that's what the devil wants to do with people's lives. That's what he wants to do eternally with people's lives. That's what he's up to now in this world in people's lives. It's why he distracts people from the truth of Jesus Christ. But this passage is saying, take heart, because Jesus Christ has awesome authority. You see, the message of the Bible is that this world is really divided in two, that there are those whom God has brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and there are those who are still in the kingdom of darkness. But Jesus Christ today is releasing men and women from the kingdom of darkness and bringing them into his light. And look at the response, and you notice that in each of these miracles there's always a response. Well, look at the response, verse 33. The herdsmen fled. Well, of course they would. They'd been looking after these swine. And going into the city, they told everything. You're 2,000 pigs. They went over the edge. But look what they said also. Especially what had happened to the two demon-possessed men. They told everything that had happened, especially. Now, what would you have expected? And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to stay and to reveal more of who he was and to tell them the truth and deliver them from darkness? No. When they saw him, they begged him to leave, to leave their region. 
They had seen what, they, what Jesus had done in the lives of these two men that everyone was frightened out of their wits from and by. And they said, oh, you, what, we'd rather have our pigs rather than have Jesus. Don't be surprised if when you come to Jesus Christ there are people who are around you who have a very negative response to what has happened in your life. Jesus Christ has authority over nature. He has authority over supernatural powers. Now there's a third little picture so that we get this. He has authority to forgive. Now you need to look at chapter 9 verses 1 to 8. It's great he's got authority over sickness and death. It's great he has authority over nature. It's great he has authority over the devil. But what about my greatest problem? What about your greatest problem? It's not the cost of fuel. It's not the economic downturn. Our greatest problem is our sin. And if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is the one who God promised, He'll be able not only to heal the sick, he'll be able to not only still the whole of created order when it's raging, he'll not only have authority over the uh, demonic world, but he will be able to forgive sins. Zechariah the prophet prophesied in the Old Testament, chapter 13, that when the Messiah came, a fountain would be opened, great picture, where men and women could find pardon, could find forgiveness, through the work of the Messiah. And now in this miracle, Matthew is taking another situation from Jesus' life and laying it down on the table. It's his ace card. This is the Messiah. You'll see from verse 1 that he's back across the, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee and getting into a boat he crossed over and came back to his own city. Uh, it's his adopted city. It's Capernaum he's back into. Was he now back in Peter's uh, family home? Possibly. And Matthew, again here, gives a, a slightly abridged version of this miracle, guided by the Spirit. The other Gospels give the, the, the wonderful graphic detail of these men, of some of four men carrying their, their paralyzed friend. They can't get into the room. They go up the, the steps at the side of the house. They open up a hole in the roof and they, they let, the Lord, let the man down uh, before the Lord Jesus. Matthew just writes, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. This man has some good friends. Uh, and a good friend is someone who tells you about Jesus and brings you to Jesus. That's how you know how to be a good friend, by the way. You'll, you'll keep bringing them to Jesus. And you're praying and, and you're speaking. And this paralyzed man who can do nothing on himself, as he asked his friends, perhaps he has indeed. And together, they know that the Lord Jesus can do something about this impossible situation for when this man comes before Jesus, we're told in verse 2, and when Jesus saw their faith, he could see right into them. He could see these men had a measure of trust and belief about the one who was before them. No doubt they were frightened. No doubt they were filled with awe, with all the stories that they'd heard, maybe the things that they'd seen. And the Lord Jesus just spoke so tenderly as he does in all these situations in verse, three, verse 2. Take heart, my son. Then he says these amazing words. Your sins are forgiven. This man just wants the, the superficial thing in his life dealt with. And Jesus goes right down deeper. And he deals with the deepest need of his life as well as giving him the ability to walk again. He said, your sins are forgiven. What authoritative words. It's a lovely little word, by the way, forgiven. It has the idea, your sins are, are sent away. 
Have a think about your life. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus has said these very same words over you. Your sins are forgiven. They are removed as far as east is from the west. Pardoned. Right with God. How happy this man must have been. But not everybody was happy, were they? Verse 3. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. He's claiming to be God. Only God can forgive sins. And the Lord Jesus could see right through it. As he can see right into your heart and mind today. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? Wasn't the Lord Jesus just so wonderful with his words? What a brilliant question. He stumps them. It's virtually unanswerable. In some ways it actually is easier to say your sins are forgiven to someone because you can't see the outworking of that compared to saying rise and walk. Well, you can see that. On the other hand, a healer could say arise and only God can forgive sins. And that's what the Lord Jesus was doing. He was making it crystal clear about his identity. I'm God. He's taken the form of a man, yet still God. And I've come to deal with the deepest problem of the lives of men and women. Their sin. Isn't it just so wonderful that there's just one person to go to when we're troubled by our sin. We don't have a whole host of people we've got to go and find out about. There's just one person. Because of one person, there's forgiveness. And it is the God-man, Jesus Christ. That's the best news ever. Because our sin, the Bible says, it separates us from God. Our sin keeps us out of heaven. Our sin just ruins everything. The wages of sin is death. But here's this one who has the authority to say your sins are forgiven. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to talk yourself into some situation. It's, those are futile things. You've just got to go to Jesus Christ who because of what he had come to do, die on the cross, he, he come to take the wrath of God that sinners like, like me and you deserved and because of what he accomplished, there's forgiveness in him. And this man, he, he's forgiven. Forgiven on the inside, he's fixed. And this man is fixed on the outside. We're told there in 6 and 7. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose him at home. Look at the response. There's again the response. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now their response wasn't just perfectly right. There's still a little bit of confusion. They didn't still fully grasp that this man alone is the one to go to for forgiveness of sins. But they were filled with awe. And they glorified God. So what's your response to this Jesus? This one with authority beyond measure. A couple of weeks ago I, I got in touch with a friend. I hadn't seen him for quite some years. All my fault. Should have been in touch with him earlier. 50 year old gentleman, he's a minister in, a, in another denomination, loves the Lord, preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, serves him in so many wonderful ways. 
And when we got together, we did the usual thing. We talked about our family. And then what pastors do, they, the next question after his household of family is, what are you preaching on these days? It's always the next question. Not where you're going on your holidays or anything like that, but what are you preaching on? I said to him, I'm preaching on Matthew 8 and 9 at the minute. And as soon as I said it, his face lit up and he smiled. He said, oh, I, I love those chapters. When I was a teenager, I had no thought of God. I had no interest in God. I, he, he went to church one day and he heard someone preaching in Matthew 8 and chapter 9. And these were the words to a disinterested teenager. These are the words that this man who was once a disinterested teenager said. He said these very words. He said, as I listened, it was as if Jesus walked right off the page of the Bible and into my life. May that be true of you today. To the glory and honour of this glorious Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, we sing praise to God from Psalm 103, verses 7 to 11. Beautiful words, according as our sins deserved, he did not deal with us, nor did he pay us what was due for our iniquities, rather he paid his son what was due. Psalm 103, 7 to 11, we sing God's praise. should be drawn to him in deeper devotion, that every moment of our lives should be given to serving this great King, able to save to the uttermost all who call on him. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen. <laughs>